what is the new supply chain going to look like? And I make the point, there have always been supply chains. The, the book begins with uh, um, the story of a, a, a wreck that was discovered, a shipwreck that was discovered in a place called Ulu Barun, which is off the, the southern coast of Turkey in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, but it was from approximately 1100 BC. It's the best preserved Bronze Age shipwreck that's ever been discovered and they did underwater excavation and they found the cargo is very much intact and they found uh, amber which comes from the Baltic Sea they found uh, sores which were at the time were made in what is present day Lebanon along the coast of you know, what is Syria today they found gold which came from um, Sudan via Egypt they found a scarab that was uh, for Queen Nefertiti of Egypt etc the point is when you looked at all the goods and said, so, okay, where did they come from or where were they going? This vessel was making a, a counterclockwise, uh, coastwise journey around the Mediterranean, just using the favorable winds, picking up cargoes and dropping them off along the way. But when you say, okay, when you go to the Baltic, to the equator and present day Iran to Spain, uh, that's, that's an area of 5 million square miles. So there's nothing new about supply chains. What was new beginning in 1989 with the fall of the Berlin Wall and then later the, uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union was supply chain science. That was when the computing power and computing capacity came together with better data, better data collection algorithms um, and artificial intelligence to create a real science and it's of course taught in universities uh, these days to, to manage these supply chains. And they became very, very, very efficient. Now, uh, just-in-time inventory, yeah, that's a classic. That's absolutely the norm. Um, but there's a, a continual science of, you know, identify a bottleneck. Um, there's always one, you know, if you're, if you're putting cars together and you want to make a thousand cars a day and you only have 800 tires or sets of tires, well, you're only going to make 800 cars because you don't have the tires. And then you say, well, okay, let's get some more tires. And you do. Uh, but then you find out there's another constraint somewhere in the uh, chain, which is, uh, you know, bumpers or windshield, whatever. But but the point is you're continually making that more efficient. If you have seven suppliers, you might cut it down to two, give them larger purchase orders. If you have five transportation lanes, you might cut it down to three. Again, concentrate it and give larger orders, get lower prices, et cetera. And Walmart and Amazon, of course, are the, are the champions of this. The problem is the whole time you're doing this and doing it with very sound scientific and computer and analytic tools, you are making things cheaper for the customer, but they're hidden costs. And the costs were never taken into account. And the costs were uh, the frailty of the whole system, the fact that the, you know, the fewer suppliers you have and the fewer warehouses you have, et cetera, the more vulnerable you are to any breakdown. And supply chain managers run these scenarios. They say, yeah, we, we get that. And we want to be you know robust to those kinds of failures. And uh, we'll, we'll have backup plans, et cetera. But they took it too far. And now as the supply chain uh, broke down, really beginning in 2018, they ter turned out not to be robust. They couldn't get the replacements and, and all kinds of bottlenecks emerged. Now, there will be a new supply chain, but it will not look like the old supply chain. I talked to an individual who probably more than any other individual was the most responsible for building the modern supply chain. And he said to me, he said, Jim, you have to understand it took us 30 years to do this. We smashed it up in about two or three years. It's going to take 10 years to rebuild. It's not going to come back overnight. It's like if you break a vase into a thousand pieces, you can't glue the pieces back together. You got to go buy a new vase. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to have new supply chains, but they're going to be very different. And uh, they'll, uh, they'll exclude China. The, the decoupling is well underway. You know, China wants to decouple from the United States as much as we, or a lot of Americans, I would include myself, want to decouple from China. So that's underway. So what you'll have, you'll still have trading partners. You'll still have dispersed logistics. You'll still have transportation lanes, but they'll be limited to friendly nations this goes by a couple of different names uh some people call it friendshoring some people call it a, a a consortium or constellation i use the phrase uh the college of nations there'll be a you know a collegial group that want to trade together there'll be liberal democracies uh you know us western europe uk canada australia new zealand japan will be included etc almost certainly india but it will not include china so China will be out of the club. They'll have to 
build their own trading networks, whatever they may be. And things will be a little more expensive as a result. I'm not talking about hyperinflation, just, you know, they'll be a little more costly. Labor costs might be a little higher, et cetera. But it'll be much more robust. It won't break down as easily and it won't be vulnerable to these nations that really don't uh, wish us well. Now, the current inflation, everyone gets it. You know, I mean, I, I talk about it and I analyze it, but yeah, you see it at the gas pump, you see it at the grocery store, you know, when you go shopping, you don't, no one needs to be told that inflation is there. It is there and it, it's very real. Um, but there are two kinds of inflation. One kind of comes on the supply side it's called cost push inflation. So higher oil prices and you know energy prices and transportation prices, which are energy driven, it all gets pushed into the consumer. The other kind of inflation is called demand pull inflation. It's when the consumer psychology is such that uh, you want to pull your purchases forward. You're saying, hey, you know, I was thinking of buying a refrigerator, but uh, I better go. I better buy it right now because if I wait three months, the price is going to be higher, et cetera. That feeds on itself. The inflation we're seeing now is, is cost push inflation. It is because of the supply chain. It is because of natural resources, the war in Ukraine, COVID, uh, hangovers, and, and a lot else. But but we don't have the demand pull inflation. That, can, that psychology has not caught on. The difference is important because the, the cost push inflation that we're experiencing tends to negate itself. You know, the old I don't know if it's a joke or a punchline, but it, you know the the cure for high oil prices is high oil prices because when price gets high enough, people use less and cut back and you know buy smaller cars or do whatever it takes, uh, and then the price tends to come down. So the inflation is real, but what uh, consumers and markets are not ready for is uh, a strong form of disinflation bordering on deflation. That will be right behind this inflation, once this recession I talked about earlier kicks in. Now, if the U.S. doesn't like what I'm doing, will they weaponize the dollar against me? And the answer in every case was they might because they just did it uh, against Russia. And so strong dollar, yeah, that's a handicap for them. But uh, that's not what's driving this. They they looked at what the United States did. This guy, Wally Adeyamo, uh in the Treasury, he's the, the sanctions made. But I know a lot about sanctions because I did a lot of that work for the intelligence community. But um, kicking somebody off of SWIFT, that's a very big deal. Freezing those bank accounts, a big deal. But freezing the reserves of the Central Bank of Russia because we don't like what they're doing in Ukraine. Well, everyone else in the world asked them the same question. They said, well, you know, what if they don't like China's aggressive posture towards Taiwan or Saudi Arabia's, um, you know, uh, friendlier relations with Russia? You know, so a long list of things. Uh, you know, Turkey's policy in Syria. What if the United States doesn't like what I'm doing? I better get out of dollars. Now, again, easier said than done. You can't do it all at once, it, but everything happens at the margin. And so, yeah, there's a worldwide effort to de-dollarize and it'll take a while, but it's because uh, we've destroyed trust. I mean, any currency is just based on trust. Uh, you trust the issuer not to go to hyperinflation. You trust the issuer not to confiscate it or steal it or freeze it or tax it, et cetera. And the minute that trust is breached, then you really don't have a lot of use for that currency. So I've, I've often said that um, the, the role of the dollar, it won't be destroyed by our enemies. It'll be, it'll be destroyed by ourselves. And that's what's happening. And I expect that to continue.